All right, now that we've seen all the things our somatosensory system can detect with our sensory receptors, the question is, where does that info go next? And the answer is, of course, to the brain. Remember that each sensory system has a primary area up in the cerebral cortex where the information is initially processed before it gets shared with the rest of the brain. So for the somatosensory system, we saw earlier that that means in the parietal lobe up at the top, okay? So specifically from the receptors, so from the things like mechanoreceptors, Merkel discs, stuff like that, or the thermoreceptors, all of those signals are gonna go up through the spinal cord into the brain through the brainstem. So it goes from the receptors to the spinal cord to the brainstem, specifically the, the medulla, which is part of the brainstem. And that makes sense because the brainstem is what connects to the spinal cord. And then as it gets into the brain, it'll pass through the thalamus. And that's the sensory gateway I've mentioned a couple times now, after which it'll arrive finally at what we call the primary somatosensory cortex, or just S1 for short. Uh, it's that little strip at the front of your parietal lobe. So basically it's right at the, the top of your brain near the middle. Now, remember somatosensation is contralateral. You may remember that means that the info travels to the opposite hemisphere of the brain. So if you're touched on your right arm, there are some neurons that'll go off in the left hemisphere of your brain. The left hemisphere gets a signal from the right part of your body. But if someone touches you on your left leg, then it's your right hemisphere that'll get the signal. You'll have some neurons go off in the right hemisphere. If you actually want to experience this contralateral wiring for yourself, you can do it right now. I'm going to walk you through a demo that might be a, a fun little attempt right now to, to make this more clear. So this works best if you're sitting. You may want to sit down and you may want to scoot your chair back a little so there's room to lift your feet off the ground just a bit. I'm going to have you try this demo two ways, what we might call the easy task and then the hard task. So let's do the easy task first. What I want you to do is lift your left foot off the ground and start spinning it in a counterclockwise direction. So opposite of a clock, left foot spinning counterclockwise. While you do that, use your right index finger, opposite hand, your right index finger to trace a clockwise circle in the air and keep doing this. So your left foot keeps going counterclockwise while your right finger goes clockwise. Pause the video and try it now if you're not already trying it. And can you do it? Most people can do this version without too much trouble, although you might slip a few times and find yourself going clockwise briefly with both of them or counterclockwise with both of them. But now let's do the hard version. So we'll do both of what we basically just did a moment ago, but we'll do both of them on the same side. Let's do them both on the right side. So this time, when I tell you to try it, you'll lift your right foot up and start spinning the right foot counterclockwise. Keep spinning it counterclockwise, and while you do that, move your right finger clockwise. So right foot counterclockwise, right finger clockwise. Got it? Okay, pause the video and try it now if you're not already doing it. How did you do? For most people, most people immediately or quickly screw this one up and find their foot and their hand sinking up in the same direction. It's much harder than that first task. Even if you maybe can occasionally keep going for a bit, people can sometimes manage it. But the reason it's so much harder and we, we kind of lose it so much easier, it's because in the, the earlier easy version, what was going on was each hemisphere of our brain could give its own separate order down to its own separate wires to the side of the body that it controlled. So one hemisphere is saying clockwise, 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 and the other is separately sending its own counterclockwise, counterclockwise, counterclockwise commands. But in the second harder version, the version we just did at the end there that most people screw up, where you're doing your foot and your finger both on the same side, it means one single hemisphere of your brain has to send both commands at the same time from its motor cortex. So it's simultaneously chanting clockwise, 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 and also at the same time, counterclockwise, counterclockwise, counterclockwise. And this makes it much more likely for interference and error in those signals, kind of crossed wires, so to speak. So it makes sense if you understand your contralateral wiring. All right. Let's, let's get back, though, to our somatosensory pathway going up to the brain, from receptors up to the brain.
remember that some of those neurons, you know, so they might call fibers, right? The axons coming out of them. Some of those neurons send signals quickly. They use myelinated axons. Like with the A delta fibers, those neurons have myelin covering their axons. So they send the signal really fast. And some I mentioned send signals more slowly. So they're unmyelinated neurons. Their axon doesn't have that covering. Like with the C fibers that we mentioned for some things like temperature perception, right? Thermoreception or that second pain, the lingering la lasting pain. So these both, the fast uh, bund the fast I don't know, wires or, or fibers or axons and the, the slow fibers or axons, they go up to the somatosensory cortex. They go up this pathway we've just talked about here. They both go up that pathway, but they go up in separate bundles of wires or separate tracts, we might say. Specifically, there's the, the myelinated fast path. So the fast path, this is where most of our touch information will follow this pathway. Also that first pain, remember I mentioned that first pain uses myelinated neurons, it goes up those fast fibers, gets to the brain really quickly. And also, as we'll see in a, a future topic, proprioception information. So stuff about like posture and where your limbs are, where your joints are, that information also goes quickly. It uses a fa fast pathway. And you can follow that here. It's the, the top set of wires, the top line. So this top blue line here is coming from the receptors. We have our little cell body, our soma here, and then a long axon. And what you'll notice is in this very first neuron, this axon here, it zooms all the way up. Down here is the spinal cord. You can imagine this extends all the way pretty far down. But wherever it happens to come in in the spinal cord, it zooms up. Before we even finish this first neuron, its axon goes all the way up until we're in the brain stem. So we're now in the brain, at the bottom of the brain. We're in the brain stem here, specifically the medulla. It's just part of the brain stem. But there, it then crosses over. It actually hooks up to another neuron. So we kind of pass the signal along to a second neuron. But here is where it crosses over contralaterally. Remember, if you're touched on the left half of your body, it's got to get up to the right side of your brain eventually. Well, with the fast pathway, it zooms up first into the brain, then crosses over. And once it's crossed over, then it'll go up through the thalamus and end up in S1, the somatosensory cortex, that primary area in the brain. So again, that first pathway, that's for, for touch, for the initial first pain, the, the quick like, oh my God, I just detected some pain happened. And, and as we'll see for proprioception. Now the slow pathway is a little different. The slow pathway, this is the one that'll send that more lingering second pain, the pain after pain. This is also where we'll get like itch, pleasant touch, and temperature. Those things we mentioned use C fibers, which again are just the slower type of fibers. They're unmyelinated. So our thermoreceptors also use the slow pathway. But here you can see, here's the example, if you just follow this going into the spinal cord, you can see it takes a more like slow meandering path. So it gets into the spinal cord, but it doesn't immediately zoom up. Instead, it slowly, it meanders over to the opposite side. Here is where it goes contralateral for the slow version, the slow pathway. It crosses now, then it goes up into the brain stem, right? Passing through the, the brain stem, passing through the medulla there. But once again, it does end up in the thalamus on the opposite side from where you were touched, or in this case, where you felt the pain or the temperature, but it is in the opposite side. And then it continues up once it passes through that sensory gateway of the thalamus, then it ends up in S1. So both paths, both of these, either way, it's gonna go through the thalamus, the sensory gateway on the opposite hemisphere from where the, the sensory receptor actually was. And then it goes to S1, primary somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe. So now we're up in the cerebral cortex, that upper outer layer of the brain, but still on the opposite side of the receptor. So we made it. We're in S1, the primary somatosensory cortex, the main initial place for info from touch and pain and temperature and proprioception and interoception and balance and all that body related input ends up here in the brain. Once again, it's that strip at the front of the parietal lobe. So again, parietal lobes here, the strip at the front is the somatosensory cortex. You can see it in this little skull picture here. And that's 
right next to it. It's kind of bordering the motor cortex we mentioned before. So the motor cortex is that strip at the back of the frontal lobe, and they border each other. They actually have a lot of similarities, as we'll see. Now, remember how for auditory information, it all started at A1, primary auditory cortex, but then quickly sent the info to nearby areas of the brain for further processing. There was an A2, a secondary auditory cortex, and then it went to other parts of the brain, right? Same deal here. So from S1, the info actually gets processed in a lot of nearby areas in the cerebral cortex. It gets integrated eventually with information from other senses like vision and sound. So specifically, if S1 is the kind of bright green strip here, the bright neon green, that would be S1. They've kind of just colored over a, a brain scan in the background here. Then the dark green area right near that down here is S2. It's actually called the secondary somatosensory cortex. It helps process the, the info further from touch and other bodily senses. And then the blue area behind those, further back into the parietal lobe, that is often called the, the association cortex. Specifically meaning this is where info from multiple different senses like touch and vision and sound all gets associated together. We actually find a lot of interesting multi-sensory effects here that we'll, we'll talk about later. The point is, information doesn't stay in S1. It obviously is going to get used and shared and combined with information from other senses and from our existing knowledge and expectations. But let's actually spend a minute in S1 itself because there's some really interesting shit going on in there. So let's dive back into S1, the primary area. Remember how... In A1, the primary auditory cortex, just like in the basilar membrane, it was organized in this nice, orderly way based on frequencies, right? We called it a tonotopic map. Well, it turns out S1 is also really orderly and logical in the way it's laid out. S1 is organized to represent adjacent body parts next to each other in the cortex, like the neurons for body parts next to the neurons for uh, adjacent body parts on your actual body. So for example, a neuron in S1 in your somatosensory cortex that fires and only fires when you happen to be touched at this one tiny spot on your left pinky Turns out that's going to be found next to another neuron, a different neuron in S1, right next door to it, that'll fire and only fire when you're touched at a spot right next to that on your left pinky. So all the little Merkel discs, the little mechanoreceptors in your left pinky, they all send their wires up two neurons in S1 that happen to be right next door to each other. And those left pinky neurons are near some neurons that respond to touches on your left ring finger. And those are near the neurons that respond to touches on your left middle finger and so on. So S1 neurons that fire when you're tapped on your right inner thigh are next to S1 neurons that fire when your right outer thigh is tapped. And those will be pretty far away from the neurons for your fingers, right? And the ones on your thigh will be closer to the, to the neurons that represent touches to your calf than the ones that represent touches to the back of your neck, which is further away on your body. So in essence, your entire body, your whole freaking body is represented in miniature in the somatosensory cortex in S1. So this little neuronal representation of our body it's often called the somatosensory homunculus. And homunculus is a word, just means little man from the, the prefix homo for man, like in Homo sapiens. And basically, the layout of the neurons up in S1, it's a miniature representation of the body. We'd actually say it's a somatotopic map a body-shaped map within the brain, kind of like we had a tonotopic map in A1 and on the basilar membrane. Here it's somatotopic, body-topic or body-shaped. You can see a depiction here on the right. The, the blue bits, that's the actual neuron. So you can imagine this is like the folds of your brain at that somatosensory cortex, the strip. Uh, we're just kind of seeing like a slice from the side. But notice they've drawn like near that, right? The drawing around here, this isn't your actual brain. This is just a drawing depicting what each of those neurons happens to fire for. And I want you to notice the neurons that fire when you're touched on your forearm, for example. So there's some neurons here that'll only go off when you're touched on different parts of your forearm. 
Those are right next to the neurons that only go off when you're touched on your elbow. And those are next to the neurons that only go off when you're touched on other parts of your arm. And the, the you know, forearm neurons are right next door to the hand neurons. The hand neurons are right next door to the finger neurons and so on. So the neurons for touches to your nose, for example, so somewhere around here, happen to be right next to the neurons that go off when you're touched on your lips or elsewhere on your face. As a kid's song goes, the leg neurons connected to the hip neuron and the hip neurons connected to the trunk neuron, right? It's got, it's, it's a freaking map. It's pretty impressive. Now, uh, the, the, this is sometimes you'll see this, the, the homunculus drawn like this. If you just search somatosensory homunculus, you'll see a shape like this. And again, it, it looks a little weird and there's a reason I'll explain this. So you might've noticed on the depictions, the last depiction plus this depiction here, or this version of seeing it, uh, You'll notice some of the body parts are shown extra large, kind of exaggerated, and, and not always the parts you'd expect someone to exaggerate either. Rather, the reason the, the fingers and lips and such are so large in these drawings depicting S1 is that we actually have a way disproportionate amount of neurons dedicated to tracking touches from those body areas. So... They, they also happen to represent the, the parts of our, our skin, the parts of our body that are most densely packed with sensory receptors out there. So why those areas of our body? Well, they're the parts that, whoops, sorry, they're the parts that we most actively explore the world with. Like we need our fingers to have a lot of detail and acuity so that our touches are accurate when we're feeling things. And, and ditto for our lips and our tongue, which are essential, evolutionarily speaking, and that's pretty essential for something that keeps us alive, like eating, right? And being able to, to chew and process food in the mouth. And, and indeed, actually, we'll see tactile or touch information from the tongue is an important contributor to the flavor experience. We'll, we'll see that at the end of the course. Okay, now, how, how the hell do we know that this map exists? Like, how do we know that a particular neuron in S1 fires only when we're touched at one specific place on our body? In other words, how did we discover the homunculus? Well, it was actually discovered back in the 50s. A now famous neurosurgeon named Wilder Pinfield, uh, he prodded the awake brain during epilepsy surgery. Basically, uh, a lot of neurosurgery is done with the patient totally awake for a couple of reasons. One, because there are no nociceptors within the brain. So that means no pain from any poking or cutting or anything like that that happens inside your brain. But two, the second reason, because if you're going to surgically remove a little bit of brain to treat someone for epilepsy or a brain, a brain tumor or whatever... You want a way to make sure that you've kind of mapped things out so you know what you're removing and can remove the minimal amount necessary. So that's what Wilder Pinfield was doing. He, he decided during these surgeries that they were going to be doing anyway to help people that he should do a little systematic prodding of the brain. So specifically, with a little electrode, you can clamp on to an individual neuron or a little area of neurons and jolt it with a bit of electricity to make those neurons activate, to make them fire above their baseline firing rate. When he did that to a random neuron in their left hemisphere's S1, somatosensory cortex, the person would say they felt a little touch on their right pinky toe, even though no one was touching them. If they zapped a neuron right nearby that, the person might say they felt a touch on their right big toe, right, because that's nearby. A bit further away in the brain, so, so zapping a neuron that's a little further away in the brain, they might feel a phantom touch on their right calf, and so on. If you go further away, they'd feel a touch further away in their right hemisphere, If you go and uh, or on the right half of their body. If you go and zap a neuron in the somatosensory cortex in the right half of their brain, they'll feel a touch on the left half of their body somewhere. And pretty soon it was clear when he did this enough and mapped it out systematically, it was clear that at least a big part of S1 was the primary area for touch and that it was laid out in this amazing map of the body, a little somatosensory homunculus.
And technically, by the way, just a side note, there are a few such maps. So for touch, but also for other bodily sensory input, there are even somatotopic maps a little further in, like in the secondary somatosensory cortex. At any rate, though, uh, nowadays we've confirmed his initial discovery through a variety of other techniques that neuroscientists use. So for example, through studies of people with brain damage, that's a subfield of psychology called neuropsychology. So rather than, than messing with their brain ourselves, it's just studying people who through an accident of nature or a stroke or something like that had some brain damage. We can also do this with single cell recording, meaning again, measuring individual neurons, which normally we can only do with a human when we're already doing some brain surgery, but we can do those single cell recordings in animals so in other words, you don't have to wait for some human to already need brain surgery and to agree to be in a study. You can just experimentally operate on an animal brain. Though, of course, not every neuroscientist is comfortable doing such invasive work on animals that can't consent. But nowadays, we also have techniques like brain scans. For example, fMRI, uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, that's scanning blood flow to the brain, but that kind of signals where neural action just happened. And even techniques like TMS, so transcranial, outside the cranium, transcranial magnetic stimulation that uses a magnet to temporarily shut down or even turn on and fire up an area, meaning we can do an experimental design. We can actually turn on or off an area of the brain temporarily in a way that's safe and see what effects that has functionally so we can do proper experimental designs that are harder to do with, you know, like a neuropsychology patient. Now, as I mentioned before, a lot of neuroscience knowledge has come, at least originally and, and still today, from studies using animal models, or even just studying animals for their own sake, like to better treat pet dogs that have brain tumors or strokes or seizures. At any rate, what we found is other animals like rabbits, cats, monkeys, and of course lab rats, have a somatotopic map in their cortex too, in basically the same place as us, and, and where, kind of where their parietal would be. Their, so their brain also exaggerates the parts that for them have a lot of sensory receptors and are used to explore the world with. You can actually see a cat's homunculus here kind of emphasizes its paws, its mouth, its whiskers. And a monkey's homunculus is kind of similar to our own. It's, it's mapping up in, in the S1 part of its brain, pretty darn similar to ours and so on for other animals. In fact, rats are a really good example of this because they have a perfect mapping. We've measured out and found this perfect one-to-one -one mapping between individual whisker receptors. So they have, right, the little detectors when, they're, when their whisker gets stimulated, one of the whisker receptors goes off and sends a neural signal to the rat's brain. And in the rat's brain, we find this perfect mapping that goes along with that in the cortex of the rat. When whisker A4 is stimulated out on its face, neuron A4 back in their cortex of the brain fires and so on. So it's a mapping of the, the parts of the world, right? The, the parts of their body they explore the world with. And again, those parts that they explore with the most are the ones that have the most neural real estate dedicated to it up in their brain. All right, we'll wrap up this video here. And in the next video, we're going to dive deeper into the specific topic of touch perception and haptics, or sometimes called active touch, like when you're moving your hand along something to figure out what it is, or moving something within your hand to, to identify it or how, figure out how it's used. So that'll be our next.